We're now going to talk about an artist, or maybe it's two artists. And I'll explain that. The master of the house book, which in German it's Hausbuch, almost the same thing, who may or may not be the same person as the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Now, these two artists have drawings attributed to the master of the house book, dry points now usually attributed to the master of the Amsterdam cabinet, and painting that is attributed usually today to the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Let me explain that a little bit. When we have works of art by an artist with a clearly definable style, but we don't know the artist's name, the work exists, it is not signed, there are no documents to tell us who the artist is. So we make up a conventional name. Um, the master of the legend of St. Lucy, for example, or the master of 1499. Well, in this case, it's the master of the house book and the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Now, I said, is there one artist or two artists? Well, let me talk to you about what the works of art are that are being attributed to these names. In the Waldberg Wolfegg Castle in Germany, there is a book, a codex, that is extremely rare. It is a book of secular drawings. In other words, not religious work. It's not a Bible. It's not a book of hours. It's a secular book. And it's called a house book, you know, a book of the house. And it, it's drawings. It was obviously made for uh, you know, a particular person, and these were drawings uh, that they were interested in. And that's pretty rare to find a book of secular drawings from the 15th century. Now, there has been some legal negotiations about this one. Uh, it was actually sold for 20 million euros in 2008. Um, but the German government deemed the sale illegal because this is a art treasure of Germany. And you can't just go willy-nilly selling off uh, the treasures of a, a country. Uh, in many cases, there are laws that prevent that. So what will the end of that be? I don't know. Okay, so the drawings that are in the house book, we call the artist the master of the house book or the house book master. And for a long time, there were also some prints that were attributed to the same artist and some paintings that were attributed to the same artist. But more recently, some art historians decided that although the drawings and the prints were similar in style, they thought it's not exactly the same hand. It's not exactly the same artist. And so they gave the artist of the prints a different name. He had been known as the house book master. And you will often, if you're looking up, say on the web or in art store, uh, you want to find these prints, you would often look under house book master. But, as I say, some people think that they are two separate people. Now, for the purposes of the class, if you were identifying a work of art on an exam, I would probably allow both. 
you know, you can call it the call the uh, artist of the prince, the master of the Amsterdam cabinet, or you can call him uh, the housebook master. Now, why the master of the Amsterdam cabinet? Well, very often in European museums, uh, they call the room that has the graphic art, the prints and the drawings, a cabinet. And this is the print room or the cabinet in the Rijksmuseum, which of course is in Amsterdam. So he is the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Now, he's the artist who created the first known dry point prints. And we're going to look at those. But first, let's look at the house book master's house book. Here is an open page from the house book. And as you can see, there's text on one side and a, a full page drawing on the other side. It's kind of interesting. You have this figure flying overhead, riding a horse with plumes. And uh, the figure is carrying a banner and a scepter and a crown. And then down below, there's uh, what seems to be a series of genre scenes. Uh, you know, everybody, everyday people going about everyday activities. What is this? Well, these are, and we'll see a few others too, these are astrological drawings. And remember that astrology was taken very seriously. It was believed that depending when you were born, how the planets were aligned in the heavens, that that determined characteristics of you. Um, today, you know, some people take it as um, kind of a, a game. You know, I'll look up my horoscope and see what's going to happen today. Or they'll say, you know, what's your sign? But this was taken extremely seriously. It was believed that this was part of the order of the universe. So whoever owned the house book had the artist create these images of the different planets personified and the children of the planets. Now, when we say the children of the planets, what we mean are the people who are born under that astrological sign or under the influence of that planet. And this is a picture of Saul, the sun, and his children, the people who are born under his influence. Um, as you can see, he is between Leo, the lion, and there is the sun on the other side, um, as he transverses the heavens. This is the one that's in your text. No, this is one of the pictures that's in your text. Uh, this is the planet Mercury and his children. And so you see that personification of Mercury flying above the heaven in a, on a horse, uh, bearing a banner. And you'll notice that all of these planets are dressed in contemporary late 15th century clothing. Saul looked like a king. You know, they looked like well-to-do people, like a nobleman. Uh, it's what Mercury, Mercury, Mercury looks like a well-to-do person, a nobleman. And if you look up and, and you know some of the signs of the zodiac, you see these uh, two little babies next to each other. These are the twins, Gemini. And on the other side, you have Virgo, the virgin. And down below, you have the children of Mercury. And you'll notice that the children of Mercury are creating things. Um, there's a guy, you know, probably maybe a goldsmith, but you know, someone who's working on an anvil. Uh, down in the lower center, there is a sculptor, and uh, he has uh, a statue that he is uh, carving, uh, laid out for, his, uh, for him to work. He's taking a little break. He's going to eat a drink. <laughs> um, and let's look at a, another detail. Here you see a painter. Painting at an easel. He's painting, it looks like a virgin and child. And, uh, you know, his uh, wife or girlfriend or, you know, whoever she may be, uh, his uh, Amarata is uh, putting her arms around him, uh, you know, sort of 
what, uh, either distracting him or helping him work. Which is it? Uh, and next to him, you see uh, a person playing an organ. The children of Mercury are craftsmen and artists, and as you can see here, uh, a musician as well. Here's the planet Venus, and she flies overhead between Libra, which is the scales or the balance, and Taurus, the bull. And naturally, we would expect to see below Venus lovers, sensual pleasures. And of course, that's what we see. You'll notice that Venus is riding side saddle, that her horse is richly decorated with plumes and uh, you know, a cloth with uh, you know, these the wonderful cutouts at the edge. Um, and she's wearing a crown. Venus is dressed like a contemporary queen. And that's one of the interesting things. Sometimes when we see classical subjects, such as Venus, they aren't shown with classical form. You know, they're still shown um, as though it was, in this case, a, a, a late medieval queen, rather than, say, the nude Venus uh, from Roman statuary. Later, we'll see that influence of classical antiquity uh, coming to uh, the north and uh, influencing the art. But here we still have a more, what do we say, medieval conception of uh, Mercury, Venus, and the other planetary gods. Uh, and here we have this detail, as you can see, uh, the children of Venus are paired off, uh, they're dancing in a, a kind of ring dance. And then you see a bathhouse scene. Now, some cities had bathhouses. They were you know, public places to bathe. Um, but they often had a very bad reputation. They often were essentially brothels. Uh, and as you can see, that's undoubtedly what's going on here. So those are the children of Venus. And here is another page from the house book. Uh, this is quite intriguing. You see on one side a garden of love. Uh, once again, these people are paired off. Uh, you know, they're, they're eating, they're dancing, they have this uh, fountain. Uh, and then you go across the bridge, there's a couple that's walked off into the landscape. Uh, but you have this, uh, this, uh, this mill, you know, uh, it's a, a kind of a structure that has been shown. And, and you have to almost wonder, was uh, the point of this to show some kind of practical device? Or was it to show you, well, the voluptuous behavior of these people? Now, we said that the artist of the prince is now given a different name, the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. You'll still find uh, many places where it's called the housebook master, but some people make the distinction. And a very important point, these are the first known dry points in the history of art. Well, let's look at this work of art, and then we're going to talk about what is a dry point. You know, what is this type of print? The subject here is a holy family. And as you can see, they're in a walled garden with the suggestion of landscape uh, out the background. The buildings in the far distance are a bit lighter. Uh, the figures in the foreground are more defined. You know, it gives you a sense of you know, kind of an atmospheric distance. And this is a kind of very informal uh, holy family. Uh, you don't have a kind of rigid hierarchy with Mary seated there and the Christ child seated there and blessing. He, the Christ child is, is behaving rather like a little baby. And it's, it's kind of like 
He's a child who may be taking his first steps. Uh, mother still, uh, his mother's still supporting him. Um, and she is, as you can see, the queen of heaven. She has her halo. Uh, and then, you know, the baby Jesus looks like, what, any other human child. You know, this is uh, obviously the incarnation. Uh, he is uh, uh, fully human as well as fully God. But the emphasis here is on a kind of domestic family group. And then there is Joseph. Now, we've talked about Joseph a number of times and said that you know, during the 15th and here, you know, maybe the very early 16th century, these uh, prints are not dated. So you know, uh, that's a good approximate date, I guess. Um, during the 15th century, there is a change in the way Joseph is represented in art. And traditionally, you know, Joseph was a kind of buffoon. Uh, you sometimes see that in, in um, church plays, for example. Uh, he's the old man who doesn't know how his young wife got pregnant. Um, and yet, what we start seeing, and we think that this has to do with the rise of the middle class, and you know what we might call late medieval fam late medieval family values. Uh, Joseph, you'll remember from the Moroda older piece, is shown as a hardworking craftsman. He's providing for his family. We see a much more positive uh, view of Joseph. Now here we have Joseph in a you know pretty interesting way. Um, I suppose you could read it both ways. Uh, you know, being modern people, we look at this and we see Joseph playing with his little foster child, you know, with the Christ child. Uh, he's kind of hunkered down behind this bit of wall and is throwing apples, these little rolling apples out for the delight of the child who looks like he wants to take some steps over and, and pick up the apple. Now, of course, we remember that the apple, mala, is very similar to the word for evil, malam. And so it was often identified with the forbidden fruit. And so symbolically, when you see Christ and an apple, you often think of Christ as the new Adam who redeems the sin of the old Adam. But here it's so delightful and intimate and you know almost a genre scene, except of course, Mary is wearing a halo and a crown. Now, I suppose some people could say, well, Joseph isn't very dignified. But it seems to me he is being a good father. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. You'll notice that the shadows here, uh, that there's some, some you know, very dark uh, areas uh, that provide a deep shadow. And that is part of the dry point. Now, let me describe the technique and then you know, we'll be looking for a kind of velvety line that is created by this dry point technique. Okay, now first I should prob probably critique the drawing here. Uh, this is a diagram of a dry, dry point, but there is an error in it. Uh, it shows a metal plate as an absolute square. And generally when you have prints on a metal plate, uh, the plate would be beveled, you know, the edges would slope, and that way they will fit through the press. Otherwise, the rollers of the press would just sort of, you know, hang up on the, the vertical edge. So, okay, um, probably the person who drew this didn't actually do any dry points, uh, that he didn't know that. But let's look at how this is created. You'll remember that with an engraving, the artist takes a burin, a particular tool, and incises a line in the plate, or incises many lines in the plate. Uh, and as he incises this line, the metal is removed. You know, it, it comes up, sometimes it comes up in little curly hues. Um, and, you know, you are actually removing the metal from an engraving. And if you make a deeper line, it 
will hold more ink. If you make a more shallow line, it will hold less ink and leave a, what, a uh, lighter line in your print. Okay, how's this differ from dry point? With dry point, you have a dry point needle or some kind of stylus where you scratch directly into the metal plate. Now, I use the word scratch rather than incise or remove because the metal is still there. It's displaced. You have a groove, but you also have the metal that was displaced from that groove on either side or sometimes on one side, depending on how you hold the needle, and it forms a rough burr, this rough edge of metal. Okay, so essentially you are scratching out your drawing. And every place you have this rough burr, when you ink your plate and then you print it, just like an engraving, uh, where, where you would put uh, your plate down on uh, the bed of your, or your press. You would put your uh, dampened paper over it. You would put uh, a, what they call blankets of felt over that. And then you would roll it through the press. This is one of the presses that has rollers and the rollers force the paper into the grooves and they pick up the ink. Well, ink is also attached to the burr. So when you print it, instead of a very precise line, like an engraving, you get a velvety line, a soft line. Um, and the burr can sometimes be a very dark area because it's holding a lot of ink. And so that is the characteristic of a dry point. It can be very, very sketchy, very, very free, as you'll see uh, when you look at these drawings. But it also uh, can give you this rich, velvety line. Now, you can't print as many good dry points as you can engravings. You have a much smaller print run. And the reason, of course, is that uh, every time the plate is rolled through the press, it's pressing down the burr. I suppose if you wanted more, you could go and, you know, re-scratch it. <laughs> but uh, essentially, uh, it, it is different than engraving in that you have a very velvety line um, the, with the burr holding the ink. Okay. Let's look at the carrying of the cross by the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Uh, here, once again, you see Christ falling under the weight of the cross. And you see, um, you know, the tormentors on either side, I'm well, prodding him. Um, and you see the Holy Family here, um, off to the far left, with Mary grief-stricken, supported by John, and you just see the, the heads of the holy women beyond there. It doesn't have as many figures as Schungauer's, but what it does have are these wonderful shadowy areas with the richness of the burr. And you can see, you know, that there's a, a kind of freedom uh, when you're you know, maybe able to do some of this cross-hatching and stuff with dry point. And of course, like Schongauer's print, Christ faces us. And here they're comparing Schongauer's Carry to the Cross with uh, the master of the Amsterdam cabinets. We're using reproduction, so maybe you wouldn't see all of the, the details of the quality of the line. Uh, but with engraving, the line is more precise. With dry point, it is uh, softer more velvety, and you can see that uh, Schongauer has just shown um, a myriad of figures, this, you know, this incredible parade of the tormentors of Christ, and of course the Holy Family is in the far distance. Uh, with Schongauer, uh, you know, it's uh, 
fewer figures, um, but you know we can definitely focus on Christ. And with the other one, of course, you have Christ once again looking out at us uh, with the Schongauer's uh, fall on the carrying of the cross. Okay, the master of the Amsterdam cabinet also created some secular prints. Uh, some of them humorous, some of them sort of, you know, everyday things. Well, this one is, um, I guess you call it a, a classical legend. Uh, it probably isn't true, <laughs> but it was a story that was told about the power of women. And in this case, the very negative power of women. Uh, you're seeing Aristotle, the great philosopher. And he's crawling on his hands and knees with a beautiful young lady riding on his back. In other ways, he's playing horsey for this lovely young woman who even has a little whip in her hand. Uh, yeah, basically it's showing that even the great philosopher can be made a fool of by, what, sex. Uh, a very sensuous woman. Um, and, you know, it's warning you against that power of women to make fools even of the most intellectual of men. Here we have a purely secular scene. Uh, it is an everyday image. It is probably something that he observed and drew directly from life and then created his print. It's called the Old Bulldog Scratching, and that's what an everyday image in an age when they did not have insecticides and I'm sure that the dogs had many fleas. Um, but, you know, it's this totally unique image for the time. And it is created in dry point. Uh, and it does show you what? A secular, everyday image. In addition to the prints, some paintings have also been attributed to the master of the Amsterdam cabinet. Um, they're from um, an altarpiece known as the Spire altarpiece. And uh, here we have one of the scenes. I believe it's been disassembled. Uh, this one's in Frankfurt, in uh, the Stadel. And uh, as you can see, it's Christ uh, has just been resurrected. Uh, you know, he's come from the tomb uh, and the tomb is still closed. In fact, the sleeping soldiers are reclining on the tomb, showing you that it's really solidly closed. Um, the figure may have some Netherlandish influence. Uh, you know, it's suggested that it reminds us of a Dirk Bouts, perhaps. So, you know, could this artist have uh, paid a visit to the lowlands? Or, you know, could there have been works wherever he lived, uh, you know, in Germany, uh, that had come from the lowlands and were being uh, in a church or something there? We don't know. <laughs> but uh, remember, the master of the Amsterdam cabinet and the dry point prints and the house book master and uh, these you know, wonderful secular drawings.